An early morning start takes our three adventurers, Casilla from Brazil, Kazir from Kenya, and Gabi from Germany, to a place where the sun always shines, where a rich ecosystem exists and the only place in the world where people can encounter wild meerkats. Our guide not only knows a great deal about these fascinating creatures, but also takes a keen interest in researching their behavior and making new discoveries. For meerkats, there is not just safety in numbers, there is also companionship. These agile creatures are able to kill and even eat venomous snakes and scorpions without being hurt. They are able to survive without drinking water, getting their moisture from eating certain plants. In dry parts of the world, animals need special skills to survive. Meerkats are no exception. And welcome once again to Animal Encounters. Now we're here at the Zirkum Meerkat Park and we're actually sitting on top or very close to a meerkat burrow. Now under here is about 11 meerkats and a few babies and they're very shy so it's going to take them um, some time to come up. Now meerkats have very uh, close family bonds but they're also very wild especially these ones. So our work here today is to sit and wait. It's six o'clock in the morning and the sun is just rising over the Karoo, a semi-arid area near Oatshorn, South Africa. I think they're of a higher intelligence than your average animal because they don't live by instinct like your average animal does. They live by tuition. Everything they know is taught to them by their peers, by their older brothers and sisters. They get taught. That's why you cannot um, keep a meerkat uh, take, uh, take a meerkat that's been in captivity and bring him out here. You can't release him out here because they um, don't do well because they nobody has taught them. So, but let's um, drink our coffee. Meerkat is a universal word. It's like apartheid. It's a yeah. universal word. Yeah. You don't get it in a different language. Yeah. Meerkat is a meerkat, but um, the, the Dutch also call it an Erdmann. And an Erdbinchen in German, but the rest of the world call them Meerkat. The, the, the fancy guys call it Serikata, oh, okay. but ah. I, I don't use those fancy yeah, words. Yeah. I'm not a scientist. One thing about a Meerkat, they, they do a sentry in the, thing in the morning and they refresh the picture in their mind. They, they, they've got a photographic memory and they take a picture of everything in their surroundings. If anything changes, it's dangerous. So your Position. If you want to take a, uh, the cameras, try to be in a position where you can get all the shots you want without moving too far away. If you move, it's going to be a move, and then you're going to be there for a while because the, let them get used to you there. And your movements, please don't scratch your head like that. Just a flowing motion, and anything with slings. If you hand the camera to somebody with a sling on it. That is a snake, and they don't like those. So take a sling and then hand it. Okay. those clouds you can see a little hill sticking out. Now that's where I started my research. It's, it's just, just over this horizon there's a, a murky three peaks, little yeah. peaks sticking out. Now that's where I started with my research. From there to here in a straight line without including this massive military training base which I can't go in. That side of the base and this side. I've worked with nine different groups of meerkats. 
So there's nine different, just in line here, I'm not talking that direction, I'm just talking this line. This is the area I've worked in. Mm -hmm. The weather is good, it's warm, they might come out any moment. So listen for my voice if I say stop, where you are freeze, let them, the, the, the one that comes out first just get used to you and then move further, but go on with it now. Okay. Average family size is between 20 to 25, that's an average meerkat size. Then you get your super groups that's like 50, but they, they're not sustainable. Under 20 is a sustainable group, and this group was six when I found them. They've grown up to 13, I've lost two in the meantime, one to predators, one to a boyfriend, gone off to start their own family, and then She's now at babies, the 25th of uh, last month, that was just two weeks ago. And the babies come out the first time in about three and a half weeks, you see them for the first time. D.V. Glenister loves the Karoo. He loves the wide open spaces, the fresh air, the beautiful mountain ranges and the sunshiny days, of which there are on average 330 per year. D.V. runs a company called Meerkat Adventures. On most mornings, he takes guests out to see the wild meerkats. Habituation took him around six months. He would start at 300 meters and then come closer and closer until the meerkats accepted him. Later, he was able to bring guests for close-up encounters with the meerkats. Not much research has been done on meerkats, and so D.V. has a keen interest recording new discoveries about meerkat behavior. I feel so privileged to be here because this is the only place in the world that you can come so close to wild meerkats. Finally, two meerkats made their appearance from the burrows beneath the ground. Was it two of the three musketeers, three babies, the dominant female is the second one from the left, and then the one Away from those two standing, the one on this side is the, another mature female. That's the only mature female in the group other than the dominant female. And she's also lactating at the moment because there's babies. Mature females in the family are not allowed to breed, but they have the function of raising their mother's young. They even lactate and feed their babies. Um, there is no such a meaning to the word sericata, but the closest related word to that is surrogate. They are surrogate mothers to their mother's young. That is my conclusion. My conclusion. You'll notice they're all facing the sun. They are regulating their body temperature. Even though they're mammals and they can shiver like you and me to generate heat, shivering burns fuel, and that fuel is body fat. They do not carry body fat. So when they shiver, they burn body fuel, uh, body tissue. And that will then take much longer to re rebuild your body body tissue than body fat. So they don't, they can't afford to, to lose any body, body tissue. They've got a built-in solar panel in their tummies area, which have got a lot of veins and blood vessels. The skin is darker in the, on their tummies and they're facing the sun. It's a very sensitive such a thing. If I go, sorry, sorry, and I put my, if I want to move a meerkat's position, I can control them in a way by just 
is with my. Look at the first meerkat on your, on, closest to you. She's going, I'm going to move her from the position she's standing. I just stopped the sun, took the heat away, and she's moving to a position where she's in the sun again. They want to be in the sun. It's very important, so, and the solar panel is a very sensitive um, thing for them. When the baby meerkats start leaving the burrow system, they take on a mentor. One of the adults will teach its survival skills and how to catch and eat food. For example, when eating a scorpion, the grown meerkat will teach the baby to start eating at the sting and finish at the head so as not to be stung. With a snake, on the other hand, they will start by eating at the head. Because of the desert-like conditions, most of the meerkat's food is underground. The drier the season, the deeper the meerkat has to dig for its food. Mentors will teach the young ones how to sniff their food out from up to 30 centimeters underground. You know, when a meerkat comes out of childhood and into adulthood, he finds a mentor, someone to guide him, someone to show him where and what to do and how to do things. And I, I've learned that it's, it's wonderful to have a mentor and I'm urging you, if you don't have a mentor, find one. Wisdom always comes out of someone who's older, someone who knows what's the whereabouts, how to do things, and I know that it has helped me. And if you're an older person, look for a younger person to mentor and guide through life. They've got the one instinct, when they get a warning for danger, their tails usually go up as a sign of danger, like a flashlight, and they would run for cover. With a baby, when that instinct comes and the tail goes up, the legs go, legs go stiff as well. Everything goes stiff because it doesn't know the legs got to run. It's, something's got to go stiff, but we don't know yet what. So they got to learn to do all those things without um, getting confused. Meerkats usually forage up to three kilometers from their burrows, but when they have babies, they don't go as far. They appoint a babysitter and will come back every four hours or so to relieve the babysitter and to feed the babies. Their great grand, great, 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 great grandfathers built this. They're just expanding it. it. This burrow system is about maybe 200 years old, 300, I don't know. This is a long time going. This was flat area, all this ground has been taken out underneath and put in on top. So it is done over many years. I don't think the oldest female year has had anything to do with one chamber, new chamber. This is done. Every time they enter all, they don't, only when they're frightened, they'll run down. But usually they come to the entrance and they walk in. Always shooting what's in front of them backwards. So always new debris is coming out, new sand. So they're expanding all the time. They ask if what's their natural predators. 90, in my experience, 99%, 95% humans. I've, I've lost one meerkat that I don't know to what, and I'm sure, assuming it's, a, it's a, a prey animal because I haven't found the body. But in two and a half years working with nine different groups of meerkats, I've lost 38 meerkats. 22 in one day to secondary poisoning. They went to forage in an orchard where the farmers got orchards. Two weeks before they harvest, they put out poison for the birds that eat the fruit. The birds fall, they eat the bird, they die. They can take the poison from a cobra. They can eat a cobra's head or scorpion's poison sack and they won't get sick from it. Do meerkats make good pets? The question to ask is, do any wild animals make good pets? The only meerkat sanctuary in the world is in California somewhere, which is funny, but it just brought my attention to the fact that there's a, a problem with the pet trade, and that is where I come in. I'm not a conservationist as such. If you know of anybody that has a meerkat as a pet, 
because they will not have that market for longer than a year, then they, don't, they won't want it anymore because of its nature. It's going to be either put in a small cage in the backyard or just dumped in, the, in somewhere in an open field because people don't want to expose themselves to having an illegal pet because it is illegal. It doesn't matter where you go. I know some American states, you don't need exotic permits for exotic pets, but it is illegal to have a meerkat because it carries rabies. If it eats a rotten animal, it can carry the rabies and it bites you and you got the rabies, you can die. The thing is to do is contact a local nature conservation officer and say there's a meerkat and they will, they should take it away. They should, they unfortunately gonna euthanize it. The Zuko Kest Farm is 8 kilometers from Uitzon. On the Mossel Bay Road, we have stunning mountains right around. The Zuko also have stunning views on the Olifants River bed. There's lots of fish. We can hear the fish eagle pair every day. Other activities we have is by cycling, fishing. You can walk around in safety. I started about 10 years ago with the guest house. It was a normal house and gradually I renovated rooms and then add more and more. And this is a whole package. I love what I'm doing. I love people cooking, interior designing. I also love to spoil people a little bit. On the 2,000 hectare farm of the Zirku, the Meerkat project is being run. Oh, well, every morning I come, I um, take people out on tours, then I would usually go back home, have breakfast, and I will come back in the afternoons and then come and observe them while they're foraging because that's the best time on my own with the meerkats, no, no interference from the tourists and I can then study them better and then stay, I stay with them till quite late in the evening and then uh, till they go, to, go underground, then I go home. Okay, this is an old artwork, artwork porcupine burrow. Now, a porcupine burrow usually have a signature, either some porcupine quills or it have the bones of other animals lying around. Because porcupines lose a lot of quills, they would get, collect um, bones of other animals and chew on them for calcium. Um, you can see small chisel marks where the porcupine has chewed on this to get some calcium out of it. But this is an abandoned hole. The meerkats will use a hole like this or like that for safety when they have a sentry out here. Now, just to demonstrate to you, which I haven't told you, is how sentry, a sentry work. A meerkat has a small device in its ear, a flap. But the moment they dig, instinctively their ears shut off, close. So when they're digging underground, dust and sand doesn't fall in there. So when they're out foraging, and they're digging. They don't hear a warning alarm really because their ears tend to instinctively close off. So they would dig and listen. And what they listen for is the sentry. The sentry stands here and everybody forage, he finds an elevated position and look out. And he says every five seconds or so, he says, it's all right, it's fine, it's cool, go on, it's fine. And then if they stop digging and they hear it, they go on digging. And if they stop, and for 10, 15 seconds, they don't hear a, a confirmation that's fine. They know it's time to run. Because the sentry has either been taken by Peter or has gone down a hole. This is their water bottles. You can see the water coming out of there. This little succulent plant, they get moisture from the, the fruit, the insects, but that's the if you never believe in God, come work in nature, you'll see God. He has designed this so that 
their water, what they can drink, the plant that they can get their water from grows mainly on their burrow. If you look, this, this specific succulent plant don't grow out here in the bush, in the felt. Right here around the mountain. You can see where, where it's elevated. You can see the colour of, of this plant. And it's just where the ground is elevated where the meerkats have been disturbing the soil. We asked DV if we could come to the farm and do some filming of the meerkats as they come home to their burrows in the evening. When I came down, I saw some movement over there. It looked like something when I was up there, but it was the distance is too far. I couldn't, make, I couldn't be sure. What are the chances of them not coming back home today? Yeah, they have to, there's babies. If there's babies, they have to come back. We waited and waited. Would the meerkats return? What if they didn't return and then we would feel responsible for the predicament of the young? To our relief, they started appearing apparently out of nowhere. Can you see them? Right here. They're coming down the road now. Like a shepherd safely leading his sheep, Devi called his meerkats and walked with them back to the safety of their burrows. I was amazed at how the meerkats trusted Devi. They trusted that the strangers he brought to observe them every day are not going to harm them. I observed a very deep trusting relationship here between man and beast. There is such a sense of community among the meerkats. Each meerkat has a particular task, whether it be the sentry that warns the mob about danger or the babysitter that takes special care of the new babies. Each one is dedicated and works toward the well-being of the community. From the solo panels on the chests of the meerkats to the way in which their ears conveniently close while they are burrowing and the way in which they are sensed temperature these are all evidence of intricate design. I believe that God took great delight in designing the lives of meerkats. Der Tag neigt sich dem Ende zu und die Erdmännchen verschwinden wieder in ihrem Bau. Dort werden sie eng aneinander gekuschelt die Nacht verbringen. Bei der Begegnung mit den Erdmännchen haben mich nicht nur die Tiere selbst fasziniert, sondern auch wie Gott für die Tiere sorgt. So wachsen zum Beispiel die Pflanzen, mit der Erdmännchen ihren Flüssigkeitshaushalt ausgleichen, nur auf Erdreich, das bewegt wurde, also genau auf dem Bau der Erdmännchen. Faszinierend, oder? Das waren meine tierischen Begegnungen für heute. Ich freue mich schon auf das nächste Mal. Divi loves his meerkats and he also loves his creator. The same God that created these amazing creatures created the sun, moon and the stars. Thank you.